So we turn our Bibles to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. I'll read from verses 4 and 5. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. I bring you greetings from the saints in the United Kingdom and particularly from uh, Headquarters Church in Bexley. I want to appreciate God for this great camp meeting thanking him for making it possible for me to witness what God has done in this particular location. We are all seated here today because we have a roof above us. If the roof of this structure was not there, as was the situation before now, we probably would be in the basement. Because the columns here for this structure and the foundations would not provide the shelter we need to be seated here. What we're going to talk about is spiritual power for service, what we need, the power that God gives to make us usable for his service. So this structure with the foundation and the columns only, which were sticking out in positions, was not useful for us to sit here. But we thank God that God brought the roofing and made this place to be usable for us. In the same manner, those who are saved from their life of sin, glory be to God. Those who are sanctified, praise be to God. God cannot use them without the Spirit of God upon their lives. That is the reason why Jesus commanded his disciples to remain in Jerusalem. He actually said to them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. There is a requirement from God that we wait for the power to save him. So we will talk about spiritual power for service. If you want to put it in other words, simply it is the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. We'll look at uh, who the Holy Ghost is or who the Holy Spirit is. We'll also look at what the baptism of the Holy Ghost is. And we'll look at how the Spirit of God came down first at Pentecost and the preceding outpourings of the Holy Ghost Ghost up to the time of the Azusa Street Revival and what he is still doing now. We'll also look at qualifications for 
baptism of the Holy Spirit upon our lives. We will also look at the purpose for the Holy Ghost and fire baptism and we'll conclude by how to receive this power for service. The Holy Spirit is in other terms referred to as the Holy Ghost and as I continue in this Bible teaching, you'll find that I'll use the term Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit interchangeably. They mean the same thing. The Holy Ghost is a distinct personality of the Godhead. He is God himself. He is part of the triune God. When we talk of God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, the Holy Spirit forms part of the Godhead. He has personality and all the attributes of deity. That is, he is omnipresent. He is everywhere, all the time. As we are here, he is here. He is everywhere else. In this world, the expanse of the universe, he holds it up. He is everywhere. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. There is nothing that God doesn't know. We are limited in terms of what we can know. The most learned person on earth still does not know what God knows. He is omnipotent. He is powerful. He is God. He made the world to exist the way we know it. And he made you and I to exist as we are. He was present at creation. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, it says, The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So, from creation, even before creation, he existed. So from creation and on through the Bible, we see the evidence of him in the New Testament. We find the fuller revelation of the workings of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, he worked as he works in the New Testament, but his workings are different. How he worked in the Old Testament, he would appear in snapshots here and there as he was required. But thank God, this time we are, we are in the dispensation of grace, the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. It is the time of the Holy Spirit of God. He is the one that is working with the church today. So, it is the Holy Spirit that influences the life of every believer. There is no one that comes to God without an encounter with the Holy Spirit. So, those who have been born again, those who have had their sins forgiven, those who were living a sinful life and came to God, they were convicted by the Spirit of God 
of their sins as I was. So as many as are sitting here today who have had the experience of forgiveness of sins, it was through the Holy Spirit. He is the one that convicted us. We can see this from Titus 3 verse 5, which tells us, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So the, the Holy Ghost was active in making us saved. He is the one that made us to know of our sins. Without him, we would have continued in our sins. But thank God he is here. Even as I'm speaking now, a sinner will know that God is talking to me. The Holy Spirit is the one that's responsible for our sanctification. In Romans 15, 16, it says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, we also find that the Apostle Paul speaks of what the Holy Spirit does to us. He puts it this way, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, and such were some of you. What he meant was some were sinners. Some were held captive by sins in their life. And he said, but are washed, amen, but are sanctified, but are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. However, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is an experience beyond salvation and sanctification. As the Spirit of God is effective in making a sinner to be saved, the Spirit of God is also effective in making a saved soul sanctified. The Spirit of God can now come and abide in the soul of the saved, sanctified individual when he is baptized by the Holy Ghost and fire. We talk of it as the third Christian experience. The first being salvation. The second being sanctification. The third being Holy Ghost and fire baptism. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, as I mentioned earlier on, was typified in the Old Testament and spoken of by the Old Testament prophets. It was not until after Christ had come, after his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, that the Spirit of God was poured upon this world. And when Jesus completed his work on earth and returned to the Father. The Holy Spirit came as the promised comforter. We heard the choir singing, the comforter has come. He is here. So, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Jesus in Matthew chapter 3 verse 11 says, 
I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. We sang the song, Send the Fire, Send the Fire, Christ of Burning, Cleansing Flame, Send the Fire. So he sent the fire, but it's unto those that are ready to receive him can get the fire in their hearts. And I tell you, the caption of this camp meeting is we should pre prepare the altars. When the altar has been prepared and the sacrifice laid, the fire will fall. So Jesus said, I baptize uh, you with, uh, John said, I baptize you with water unto repentance, which is what he was doing. But Jesus will baptize his people with the Holy Ghost and fire. There are various theological understandings and opinions about the Holy Ghost and fire baptism. But we stand by the fact that it is the promise unto all generations. Some think it was only for the disciples or for the establishment of the church. No, the Holy Spirit is, was for the establishment of the church. Yes, it continued to be outpoured and is still being poured upon souls that are ready So we thank God for this provision of the power to save him. And also we want to make it quite clear that some think that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is about speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues was the evidence that God gave for those that received the Holy Spirit. So it's not about tongues. It's about power to save God. So when we pray, after we have received our foundational Christian experiences of salvation and sanctification, we are seeking for the power to save God. We are not seeking for tongues. In Joel, Joel prophesied 800 years before the first coming of Jesus about this Spirit of God that was going to come upon his people. He prophesied of it as the former rain and the latter rain. And the former rain, as we know it, was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And then the latter rain came in 1906, Azusa Street Revival. And then it's still falling. We are now having the rain for harvest, which is falling. So the Spirit of God is wooing people unto himself for his glory. Fifty days after the ascension of after the resurrection of Jesus and 10 days after the ascension of Christ into heaven, the Spirit of God fell down. In Acts chapter 2, we read from verses 3 and 4. Acts chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And they appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The power of God came down. But we thank God that these were a ready people. Jesus had prayed for their sanctification and he had told them to wait 
for the power to be poured upon them. Thank God for the disciples. They took heed of the commandment Jesus gave them. And in that upper room, they were praying. In that upper room, they were with one accord. They were united. All they knew was Jesus told us we should wait. Jesus told us we should tarry. And they were praying. Day one came, they prayed. They didn't know they were going to wait for 10 days. It's us who now know that they waited for 10 days. Day two came, they were praying. Day three came, they continued to pray. They didn't worry when Christ was going to send the promise or when God was going to do it. They worried about praying. That's the formula that we want to follow. We should not worry about when and how God is going to do it, but we worry about consecrating. We worry about praying. We worry about surrendering. And as we do that, God in his time. And when the 10th day came, in Acts chapter 2, we read, Acts chapter 2, Verse 1 it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord at, in one place. They were not just in one place, they were in one place in one accord. It's one thing to be amongst the throng of saints as we are, but God is interested in you is interested in me. And if I am in one accord with everybody else, God will send the fire down. If you are in one accord with everybody else, God will send the fire down. So we need to be in one place, in one accord, together, together. Suddenly, Verse 2, there came the sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house they were sitting. This place, God can fill it up. This place, God can fill it up with the Holy Ghost and fire. I was thinking, I came all the way from uh, United Kingdom, and I was thinking, God saw this place. And God knew about this place, even before all of us existed. But he, 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 he chose this place for his habitation. So I said, I thank God that God, you chose this tiny spot for your glory. And I am here to witness what you are doing in this place. So make no mistake, God knew even before I existed that I would stand on this pulpit, preaching in this holy place about the Holy Ghost and fire baptism. So you don't want to leave this place without this power, for the Spirit of God is here. He can fill this place. So. He came down in, on, in that upper room and there was this sound that came from heaven, rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house. They were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire and it set upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, all of them. We can all be filled with power and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were not seeking for speaking in other tongues. They were waiting for the promise of the Father. And when that came, 
God manifested his presence upon them by the cloven tongues of fire and by making them speak in other languages. They heard them speaking. Glory be to God. God is here. And this fire, this power can be upon you today. This very hour, God can do it. The, the Spirit of God did not only fall on the Pentecost day, what we call the great day of Pentecost. That was the former reign or the starting of the outpouring of the Spirit of God. We have experiences that occurred after that. First was eight years after Pentecost at Cornelius' house. We all know Cornelius was a Gentile, but he feared God. And when the gospel came to his house, in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 46, we read the account. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell upon them, which heard the word, as the Holy Spirit can fall upon all that are hearing the word. And they were of the circumcision which believed, and they, sorry, I'll repeat, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. And as they came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. That was eight years after Pentecost. And then 23 years after Pentecost, the Spirit of God also came down. In Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through to 7, I'm not going to read all that. You can take note of that. It was while Paul was at Corinth, and he passed through Ephesus, and when he got to the Ephesians, he found people that loved God. He found men that were zealous for God, that had been saved, that had been sanctified, but they had not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They had only received the baptism of John. And he explained to them that they can receive the Holy Ghost and fire baptism. After they have received the baptism of Jesus, Jesus sent the disciples saying, go into all the world, preach the word to them, and baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And after that had been done to them, as they listened to the sermon that Paul was preaching, they received the Spirit of God, and they were baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. Then we know of the famous, or the popular, Azusa Street Revival that took place in 1906 where a small group of people were praying. They had studied the word of God and they were hungry for God. They had been saved from their life of sin. They had received sanctification. They were holy people and they desired the spirit of God upon their lives. And as they prayed, at the Bonnie Briar Street in Los Angeles, California, God did something for them. Yeah. You know, these people, I don't know how they did it. They said, we're going to seek God for 10 days, as the disciples did in the upper room. And God visited them through their faith and poured out his spirit upon them. And it attracted those who were hungry for God from all parts of the world started traveling to California, Los Angeles to receive the same experience. That's when we hear of the fact that Sister Florence Crawford, the founder of the Apostolic Faith Church, was there. And she also experienced this latter rain gospel spirit upon her life. So we can receive the same power in our time. They got it by prayer 
and consecration, and we can do the same, and God will bless us when we do so. The accounts of the meetings were recorded at Azusa Street in what's called the Apostolic Faith, and the headings of the first way, Pentecost has come, proclaiming that many are being converted and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues as they did on the day of Pentecost. It's recorded. It's recorded. We can find this material. It's on our website in Portland. You can read about it. The Spirit of God came down mightily upon his people. And God can do the same now. We want this power to save him. It is promised power for service that we can be effective in whatever we do for God. When it comes to working for God, there is no small job. Anything is great. Be it lifting benches, be it sweeping the church, be it whatever you might call it, there is nothing too small to demand us being filled with power to save God. Remember Stephen and the other associates, deacons, were picked up to save the tables? They were full of the Spirit of God. And we know the account of Stephen in Acts 7, when the Spirit of God was upon him, as they stoned him, he started telling them of the history of uh, how God appeared to the children of Israel from the time of Abraham to, this, to their time. He was with the power of the Spirit of God upon him, and he could proclaim all this as they held stones at him. But he saw heavens opened and Christ standing up in heaven. For him, he was a gallant martyr for God. So we need the Spirit of God. It is power to save him. But what are the qualifications? The Spirit of God is not just for ministers. It's not for choristers. It's not for Sunday school teachers. It is for all children and adults the same. We all need him to serve God effectively. We, it is not for the unconverted. Make no mistake. Don't expect to have the Spirit of God without salvation. You won't get him. You can get other spirits, but not the Holy Spirit. For there is only but one Holy Spirit that comes into saved souls. When we talk of saved souls, there are those that have shunned sin. They have been washed by the blood of Jesus. And their sins forgiven. They have had their second experience of sanctification, which is the removal of the Adamic nature of sin. That, that, that propensity to sin has been uprooted from their, from their... We had Brother James speaking of this yesterday. That the man of sin nailed to the cross have been given a death blow. And from within, carnality is dead. But we are alive unto Christ. We are not subject to the demands and desires of the flesh, for we are dead to sin when we're sanctified holy. We are pure. And that purity attracts the Spirit of God. When you're ready, sanctified holy, the Spirit of God will come upon your life. So those are the qualifications. We cannot have the Spirit of God without holiness. And holiness is unto all. What is the purpose? Why do we need him? Acts chapter 1, it says, But ye shall receive power. It is power to serve God. I've um, had a few experiences of 
the generator being turned on, when the power is switched off. And when the power is switched off, the generator has to be turned on for all the gadgets get shut down if there is no power. But when the power is there, the lights turn on. So the lights can be there, but without the power, they will not turn on. In the same manner, you can be saved, sanctified. But for you to be effective for God, you need the power turned on. And that is the endowment of the Spirit of God upon your life. You've seen planes flying. Big as they are, the air buses, 350, A350, massive as it is, if it doesn't have fuel, it will not fly. But when it has fuel and the engines are turned on, it flies high. In the same way, you can be like an A350 bus, Airbus. Beautiful. But without the Spirit of God, you'll just be there, beautiful. But when the power and the fuel is on and the engine is turned on, you will fly high. That's what the Spirit of God can do for each and every one of us. So we need the power to serve God. You know, the things of God are very much at contrast with the things of the world. In the world, we have technocrats. We have specialists in doing things. But when it comes to the things of God, it is God who does it. I got the picture of one wing of this roof having been completed. That was the Tuesday before the Sunday we started the camp meeting. And I said to Brother Isaac, I thank God that the trusses are on. Thank God that God has done what has been done. And I believe that God will finish it. So what probably would have taken many days to complete took nearly four days. And I was saying, with my experience from the construction industry, that's impossible. You cannot do that. These roof sheets are going up 26 plus meters above. But they were pulled in position, as many as they are, to get this roof done. I said there must have been angels up there. The things of God are done by the Spirit of God. So we, we don't use our technical or our technical knowledge or reasoning for the things of God. It is the Spirit of God that does it. So we need more of that. So may God help us. Sweeping the church needs the Spirit of God. If you don't have him, you will be up disappointed when people walk after you have swept. But if you have the Spirit of God, you will not complain. So we, we, we need the Spirit of God. Anything we do, be teaching Sunday school, preaching as I am, you need the Spirit of God to do so. Some people just think, oh, it's just making up benches here. You won't know how to do it if you don't have the Spirit of God. It is beyond making up of benches. So we need power for service. And we need power to be able to stand when the challenges of life come. We need the Spirit of God. There are times when your pastor will not help you. There are times when your wife will not help you. There are times when your friend, the best of your friends, will not help you. But the Spirit of God can. And when you have him in your life, he will help you. So that's why we need him. We need the Spirit within us to discern spiritual things. 
It's not everything that is of God. So we need the Spirit of God to discern the things that are of God. There are many preachers out there, but how will you know? There are many writers, authors writing about this same God, but how will you know? If you don't have the Spirit of God to discern what is right and what is wrong, so we need the Spirit of God to discern the things of God. And you need the Spirit of God to know who speaks to you when things happen. And it was Jesus who said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. But he was saying, don't go to Jerusalem to be crucified. Wasn't he loving his Savior? He did. But it wasn't the right time to say so. So we need the Spirit of God to discern the things of God. It is the spirit of truth. And it guides us into all truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in him that is in the Holy Ghost is all truth. In John 14, 17, we are told, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it cannot it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I want the Spirit of God in me, not about me. That is the purpose of having this power for sin. The Spirit of God comes and dwells within you. The enemy wants to trap us into sin, to do all things that weaken our faith, but we need him to guide us, to tell us to go and not to go. It's not all the times we go. There are times when we don't have to go, even when it looks like we should go. Didn't the Spirit of God forbid the disciples to go and preach? But you think it was a good thing to go and preach, but the Spirit of God forbade them that they should not go. So it's not all the times that we, we go. The Spirit of God can tell us not to go. He is our teacher. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. I need the Spirit of God to remind me his words. You need the Spirit of God to teach you all things. Whatsoever I have said unto you, he will teach us. I mentioned it. It's not about speaking in tongues. That's a huge deception in our time. People will stand up and start talking and talking and show, try to prove that they have the power of God. The Spirit of God is power to save God. You can jump up, you can scream. It doesn't show evidence of power. The disciples, when they prayed, they just prayed and the power came down. We're not told they were jumping and screaming and doing. They were praying. So it's not fleshly manifestations. It is the power of God. So we need power, not fleshly manifestations. So beware of the spirit of saying it's about speaking in tongues. Though he spoke in languages as the Spirit of God gave them utterance to speak. Well, it can come as a gift, but God decrees that. So, we can receive him. But how? How do we get this power for service? That's what we want to conclude. Jesus actually said in Luke eleven thirteen. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? 
take note of that. Jesus said you can give your children bread when they ask for bread. When they say they want sweets, you give them sweets. When they want fish, you give them fish. When they want amala, you give them amala. When they want pounded yam, you give them pounded yam. You don't give them something else. So may, may, may God help us. If we know how to give our children what they ask for, God will give us the spirit when we ask for him. So we need him. But the formula is to wait. We wait in tarrying. Tarrying is simply praising God, consecrating your life to God. God, I want more of you. I need power to serve you. I need this power to be able to be effective in your service. I don't want to do this out of my strength. For your word says, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I want to serve you through the spirit of God. I want the spirit of God to lead me. I want him to direct me. I want him to teach me. As you pray, consecrating your life to God, asking for God, with your heart laid on the altar, the fire will fall down. In Luke 24, And behold, I send the promise of my Father, but tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. Some people don't want to wait. But I want to put a disclaimer. It's not about waiting for too long. That would define that I got the real. You can wait in consecration. That's what it simply means. Some people's waiting is after they've just been saved, they can get their sanctification. Some people's waiting is two days. Some is three days. But you need to be wholly surrendered, wholly consecrated. As you are waiting, the Spirit of God will come down. John 7, 37 to 39, that's where we're going to end. In that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. But now Jesus has been glorified. So we can receive the Spirit of God. The, the challenges. At Pentecost, they were praying. 1906, they were praying. Those other times when the Spirit of God came down upon them, they were praying. The challenge is, are you going to pray to receive this power from on high? The altars are open. Let's come forward and pray, and God will bless you as we do so.